It was in no way given that I should sit here today and talk about beyond budgeting because my career started in a very different place. Actually, my first career plan was the military. I actually spent um, a year at an officer school um, before I practiced as a sergeant a year afterwards, but I got an overdose of um, um, receiving and, and exercising command and control. So I went for business studies instead, graduated in 1983 and uh, joined uh, what is still my employer. We were called Statoil at the time. Today we are called Equinor. And I joined the company in the corporate budget department where I became the manager the year after. So I've been heading up more budget processes in my life than what I want to be reminded about. Actually, I have done a lot of stupid things in, in my life, but I know what I'm talking about. So how come I ended up here? It's a long story. In um, uh, 1994, uh, Statoil established a new petrochemicals company called Borealis together with a Finnish company called Neste. This became um, the largest uh, petrochemicals company in Europe at the time and headquartered in Copenhagen and 30 plants across Europe. And I was heading up the finance function in this uh, company. And through some coincidences, we actually got the chance to kick out the budget in that company uh, before there was anything called beyond budgeting. So it was a big jump into the unknown. We hadn't heard about anyone else, even if there was other companies, a few. But it worked. It worked quite well. The cost actually came down. Uh, some years later, um, 1998, I moved from finance to uh, human resources. Um, so I was heading up HR in the same company for four years before I ret returned to um, Statoil 2002 and started to work as corporate controller for our international um, business. But my hobby at the time, that was to pester my colleagues with the stupidity of the budgeting that that, that company was doing at the time. And looking back, I don't think I was very diplomatic. Uh, and I think there was a, a point when um, if they could have kicked me out there, I think they would. But anyway, um, we sorted things out and went together with to the executive committee back in 2005 and proposed um, not just to kick out the budget, because now this had become broader. Now it was more about changing the way we were leading and managing. And um, um, we got a yes. And since then, I have been working full time on this, heading up the implementation in that company as well. Um, and um, doing something that I've done actually all the time, um, spending time outside of the company, um, doing workshops, doing things like this, um, some consulting. Um, so today I spend roughly half of my time um, outside of, of, of the company. I'm still 100% employed, so, so my employer is, is, is invoicing. Um, and it's a nice combination because we are still on the journey and we have some great and interesting discussions still. Uh, you could be partly on the inside, partly on the, on, on the outside. So that is how it all started. I'm also the chairman of the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, which is an uh, international network of companies uh, interested in this. Uh, we, uh, in normal times, we meet uh, at least twice a year in, in uh, typically London. Today, we are compensating with a lot of um, online activities. So uh, check out uh, bbrt.org. Uh, we have a few technical problems from time to time, but uh, it's hopefully up and running now. So that was a long, um, that was a long introduction. Um, so let me share my slides with you. And this is the topic of today. I hope you can see my slides. Sounds like a yes. Good. So uh, what I want to start out with is um, the case for change, what is the problem? And, and you all got, you know that there are serious problems here with traditional management, including budgeting, but uh, maybe there are some problems that you haven't thought about, and maybe this problem is even bigger than what we sometimes think. 
the good news is that there are solutions. Um, beyond budgeting is such a solution. Beyond budgeting is actually a somewhat misleading name. And we know because the purpose of beyond budgeting is not necessarily to get rid of budgets. The purpose is to create organizations that are more dynamic, more flexible, more adaptive, more human, or more agile, if you want. And in order to make that happen, we need to change traditional management. And at the core of traditional management, you find not just the budgeting process, but also the budgeting mindset. So this is where the name is coming from. But um, it is, as you maybe know already, it is much bigger, much wider. And if you have a proposal for a better name than Beyond Budgeting, please. We have been looking for one for uh, years, and we still are. Um, but it better be much better, and not just a little bit. But please let me know if you have a proposal. So I want to talk about the model. Uh, then a few um, interesting cases before we move to the main case today, which is the Equinor uh, version of Beyond Budgeting. We call our model Ambition to action. So that's basically the outline for today. Every time I talk about beyond budgeting, there's one word that keeps coming up over and over again. And that word is control. And the context is, of course, the fear of losing control. And when I ask people, what do you mean with control? What, what, is, what is it that you are so afraid of losing? After people have said cost control, a lot actually go quiet. They struggle with putting words, defining what they mean with control, which I find quite interesting given that they are so afraid of losing it. Anyway, if we take a look at Oxford Dictionary, they tell us that it is the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what does this mean in organizational terms, in business terms? Well, it basically means controlling people and controlling the future. And behind these two lies the two assumptions that underpins almost everything in traditional management. Assumption number one, people can't be trusted. Assumption number two, the future is predictable and planable. And we are challenging both those assumptions heavily in Beyond Budgeting, because we think these are illusions of control. Of course, you can. Uh, I mean, it is an illusion that, that, you, that people can and must be managed. Well, of course, you can manage people. But if people are managed in stupid ways, they typically or hopefully find a way around in order to get their job done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing we know is that we don't know. There are wise people agreeing with what I'm saying here. And you've heard about this guy, good old Peter Drucker. Most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. And Peter Drucker, he talked a lot about trust. And um, one reflection on trust uh, from my side here. Before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot, way too much. And the first thing I always checked when I opened uh, the hotel room door um, and entered the room, that was what kind of clothing hangers does this hotel have? Because we typically meet one of these um, as hotel guests. And I think we can all agree that uh, the one at the bottom is a hassle to use compared to the one at the top. So how come that some hotels still use something which is a hassle for their hotel guests? Well, I think the reason is that there was probably a time or an occasion or two when somebody stole that traditional hanger with a hook. And what was the reaction? What was the response? To punish everybody, putting everybody in jail because somebody did something wrong. Actually, one of the problems with traditional management. When it comes to the future and planning the future, another wise person you've heard about him, Russell Eckhoff, he compared a lot of the corporate planning he observed. He compared it with a, a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. 
And I understand what Mr. Eckhoff was talking about here because I have done a lot of dancing in my life. I'm not sure it really improved the performance of the organization. All right, so much for wise people. Imagine an organization that a hundred years invented a fantastic machine, state of the art and crucial for the success of this organization. 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble. And today, this machine is completely broken. Kaput, it looked like this. You will all probably understand that this is not a true story, and it isn't. Because in real life, people would have gotten together 50 years ago and done something here. Either try to fix the machine, or even better, try to invent a new machine, a much better one because innovation is something we all love. Innovation is great, wonderful. We all want to be leading edge, unique, right there in the forefront, better than everybody else. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology innovation into products and services. But there is also something called management innovation that we shall talk about today, exploring new ways of leading and managing. And management innovation, that is not great. That is scary, right? Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? The consequence is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side. Everybody is into that kind of innovation in some form or shape. When it comes to the management innovation arena, that is not yet a crowded place because it is scary. And this is actually good news for companies who dare to explore and embrace also management innovation and not just technology innovation, because you can get just as much competitive advantage, performance out defined in the right way out of management innovation as you can from technology innovation. And there are, as you know, companies out there who openly uh, admit that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we produce and what we sell. We find it in the way we lead and manage. So we are back to this performance word um, defined in the right way. So I will talk a lot more about that important word. That is the reason why we should do this stuff, because it is good for performance. But before that, it is still called beyond budgeting. It has something to do with budgets. It has something to do with budget problems. So before we move on, I want to share with you my budget problem list. It's quite a long list. This is something that people very often mention first. It's a very time consuming process, making budgets, following up budgets. And by the way, when I talk about budgets here, I'm not just talking about project budgets or cost budgets. I'm also talking about uh, revenue budgets, P&L budgets, cash flow budgets, balance sheet budgets. So think about the totality here and not just about um, uh, project or development uh, budgets. Very time consuming. I did a workshop with a French car producer in Paris uh, some time ago. And you know when the budget process started? In March. Do you know when it was finished? In March, the year after. Maybe that's why they call it the annual budget. Anyway, they realized they had a problem. Assumptions quickly outdated. Uh, well, these days we know all about that. 2020 was full of, or last year was full of dead 2020 budgets. And right now 2021 is uh, also being filled up with equally dead and outdated budgets. This is a serious problem. Budgeting can stimulate what I would call unethical behaviors. The lowballing, the sandbagging, the resource hoarding, the gaming, the internal negotiations, that's not the kind of behaviors we would like to see. I'm not necessarily blaming people uh, behaving like this because it's basically the system that we ask them to operate within that is to blame, but still a serious problem. It can create these illusions of control that we just talked about. Of course, it might feel very comfortable to have next year described with a million details and, and accounting position and decimals. But again, the only thing we know is that we don't know. It will be wrong. 
if we don't have control, whatever that word means, it's better to acknowledge that we don't have control and act accordingly than to think that we have control and act accordingly. Budgets and budgeting forces us often to make decisions too early. We have to decide in the autumn or in the fall, the year before, uh, what we shall do next year and what it shall cost. And in big companies, uh, too many of these decisions are often taken too high up. It doesn't always improve the quality of decisions. Very often it is the other way around. Budgets can prevent us from doing stuff that we should have done, but we can't because it's not in the budget. But this also works the other way around. It can lead us to do things that we maybe shouldn't have done, but it is in the budget and it is spend it or lose it. You know the game. And linked to this, um, I acknowledge, I accept that the budget can be a very effective ceiling for cost. But let's not forget that it is just effective as a floor for cost in the sense that these budgets tend to be spent for the reasons that we just discussed. To define good performance as hitting the budget numbers is a very narrow, a very mechanical, and sometimes a completely outdated way of defining uh, good performance. We need a richer, broader, more intelligent performance language. Most people that I've shared this list with uh, agree and recognize um, Often all these problems uh, and always most of them, but there is one additional problem that many haven't thought that much about. I have called it conflicting purposes here. And the interesting thing with this problem is that, yes, it is a problem, but it also represents a solution uh, that actually can solve many of the other problems on this list. And I will come back to that um, problem a little bit uh, uh, later. Um, before. I do that. I want to talk more about performance. And some of you know that I like to use traffic as a metaphor for performance, because in traffic, when we are out driving, we would also like to experience good performance. And for me, that would be a safe and good flow. I simply hate traffic jams. And by the way, I never understood why they call it the rush hour. There was no rush at all. Those cars are standing dead still, but there's so much I don't understand. Anyway, I think traffic authorities want the same, a safe and good flow. And uh, this is something that, um, this is something that we often meet, put up by traffic authorities to create a safe and good flow. This traffic light has no sensors. No, no, no high tech, okay? And the one who makes decisions here about when you can drive when, and when you have to stop, that is of course the one who programmed this light. And where would this person be as um, um, we sit here, uh, as, as, as we sit there waiting for that green light? Well, obviously somewhere else. Right? The person would not be in the situation. And the information that this programming would be based on would not, be entirely fresh information because that would be some historical information, uh, maybe some forecast, but not entirely fresh information. Before I move on, I think that somebody is uh, unmuted. So if you please could mute, if there's some background noise. Thank you. So this is one way of uh, managing traffic to create a safe and good uh, flow. Uh, the, um, uh, fortunately, there is a very different and better solution. We are talking about the roundabout. And here, the answers are very different because here we are in control as drivers. We take decisions about when to drive and when to stop. And the information we use is fresh, real time, here and now information. So very different answers. It could be interesting to compare a bit more these two ways of managing. So let's do that. And here I've got a few leading questions for you. Which of these two is normally most efficient? Well, it's actually proven. The roundabout is not just more efficient, it's actually also safer. Which is most difficult to operate it? Which takes most competence? 
And of course, it is the roundabout. It takes more competence. Uh, and let's, if you go back to our organizations for a minute, everything that we need to uh, leave behind of traditional management is in many ways much easier for everybody involved, employees, um, especially managers, <clears throat> compared to what we need to move towards. But we can't go for what's easy because it's easy. We have to go for the stuff that's good for performance. And that takes more competence from all of us in a broad sense. Is it relevant to talk about values in this setting? And the answer is yes. At Equinor, we are trying very hard to be a values-based company. It means a lot for us. And the opposite, we can maybe a bit simplified called <clears throat> a rules-based company and or rules-based management. And the traffic light is a good example of rules-based management. Green is stop, red is drive. We can always discuss the, the one in the middle. Um, and if there is a value set <clears throat> among drivers waiting for that green light, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest. That mindset is normally not a big problem in front of that light. But in the roundabout, me first, don't care about the rest, can actually be a big problem. Because here, we are much more dependent on everybody involved sharing a positive or having a positive common wish or purpose of wanting this to flow well. Here, we have to help each other. We have to interact with each other in a, in a way that is very different from what we need to do in front of that, that, that light. So it's not enough with fresh information, the authority to act on it. We also need a positive value set. Two other important words here. Uh, trust is obviously obviously one uh, in front of that light. We are not trusted to make decisions in the roundabout. We are. Transparency is also relevant here. In front of that light, transparency is, is not important. As long as you can see the color of the light, you can make your decision. Uh, in the roundabout, you need to see everything, the entire situation before you can make your decision. And last but not least, ahead of that light, you can sit and doze off and let the mind wander and listen to the radio. In the roundabout, you need to be on, present in the situation. I think words are quite important in the stuff that we are talking about here. I'm quite sensitive to a lot of the words and labels in the corporate language, uh, especially this one, performance management. Just chew on that one, performance management. I find it quite negative because what we actually are saying is that if we don't manage performance, there will be no performance. And I also think there is quite some illusion into that label. I think our ability to manage performance in today's realities is somewhat more limited compared to what we often like to think, whether we work as ex executives or managers or in finance or human resources. But performance management is a label that fits nicely when we talk about the traffic light, because that is exactly what the traffic authorities are doing. They are managing performance very directly. In the roundabout, it is about something else. Here, it is about creating conditions for great performance to take place. It is about enabling performance, not managing performance. And this, my friends, is more than playing with words. These are two fundamentally different ways of addressing that important question. How do we get the best possible performance in organizations? The roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. And in today's uh, business and people realities, organizations need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. And none of these will be unfamiliar for you. The first is obviously about our business environment with all the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity out there. And uh, if, we, if we acknowledge that, VUCA, it must have implications for how we design our management models compared to if there is little or no VUCA out there. That should be quite obvious. The other reality we need to reflect on is not external, it's internal. It has to do with people. 
And it has to do with asking ourselves a simple but important question. What kind of people do we generally believe we have in our organization? And you will be familiar with um, Douglas McGregor and his uh, theory X and Y framework, which uh, fits um, nicely for this discussion. Um, theory X, as you know, this view that most people is a bunch of potential thieves from crooks. And unless we manage them tightly and keep them on short leeches, they will all run away and do a lot of stupid things and spend money like drunken sailors. Well, as you know, those were not McGregor's words. He was a bit more polite and academic, but I think that's what he meant. Then you have his theory why. It's much more positive view on people. This view that most people actually want to perform, want to be involved, want to be listened to, want to be treated as adults. And we don't need to agree so far on where our sympathy lies, X or Y, even if I certainly have, have, a, have, a, have a certain hope here. But it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in X, our management model should look very different compared to if we mainly believe in Y. That is very obvious. If we combine these two realities, the world out there, people in the organization, it could look like this, you recognize the two, and traditional management lies in that lower left-hand corner with a conscious or unconscious assumption that the world is still a, a stable, a planable, predictable place and that most people is on the uh, X side. If we disagree with that, then that is not the place to be. Then we need to move up in that upper right-hand corner by addressing both leadership horizontally and our management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of traditional management lies in that lower left-hand corner with a conscious or unconscious uh, um, uh, view here that, that uh, uh, again, uh, most people is on X on, on, and, and the word is planable. Uh, so very rigid, very detailed, very annual, a lot of rules-based, micromanagement, centralized command and control, um, a lot of secrecy and a strong belief in, in sticks and carrots as ways to drive uh, performance. Maybe there was a time when this did work. Again, if you go back to uh, the budget problems I, I talked about and, and, and budgeting as a, as a, <clears throat> as a management uh, technology. That is a pretty old management technology, invented roughly 100 years ago. And you might know that the inventor was Mr. James O. McKinsey, the founder of McKinsey Consulting. And um, I never uh, met Mr. McKinsey, obviously, but I actually don't think he was an evil man. I think he had the best of intentions back then. He wanted to help organizations to perform better. Or at least I hope we had these good intention, intention. And, I, and I think I had. And uh, again, it probably worked back then, maybe even 50 years ago. But today, this way of thinking, this way of managing is doing the opposite. It has become more of a barrier than a support for getting out the best possible performance in the organization. And that is a pretty big problem, not just with budgeting, but with traditional management. I have shared um, this description of traditional uh, management with, with hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the many years I've been working with this. And I have to admit, it is a bit scary that uh, quite some of the looks I get tells me just one thing. Isn't this the way it has to be? And sadly, it is. this is the way that a lot of uh, companies uh, today still are managed, even if they have quite a professional and uh, on a progressive uh, external image behind the curtain, it is very often Stone Age. So what do we need to do? Uh, there's no rocket science here, but uh, let me share with you how I've decided to formulate it. On the leadership side, we need to be not just more values-based, but also more purpose-based. There has to be more autonomy. There has to be more transparency. And here comes that important word again. And here, it is actually good news 
for all the scared uh, people I've met who are so afraid of losing control, because transparency can actually be quite an effective control mechanism, a social control mechanism. Uh, a little example here. Uh, Swiss pharmaceutical uh, company Roche did a very interesting experiment a few years ago. Today they are on a beyond budgeting journey, by the way, but they did a very interesting experiment um, on before that on travel cost. In a pilot, they kicked out the travel budget, kicked out all travel rules and regulations, and replaced it with full transparency. So with a few exceptions, everybody could see everything. If you travel to where, did you fly, sleep, eat, cheap or expensive, um, open for your colleagues to see and vice versa. And guess what happened with travel cost in that pilot? Came down <clears throat> through a very simple self-regulated control mechanism. This was about tearing out pages in the rules book instead of doing the opposite. But <clears throat> let me add on to transparency here that it is a very powerful mechanism. It has to be applied with wisdom. And if it becomes naming and shaming, then it doesn't work. And we should always position transparency more from a learning perspective than from a control perspective. How can we learn from each other if everything is secret? And the, this control effect, you get that as a, as a subtle side effect in any case. And last but not least, internal or intrinsic motivation as opposed to extrinsic uh, or external motivation. <clears throat> and as you all know, the most common way of motivating people externally in business today is individual bonus. And you probably also know that there is no area where there is a bigger gap between what business is practicing and what research is telling us. It's simply amazing um, how um, so many companies and HR functions and, and, and uh, managers still believe in what I basically call managerial laziness. Because of course, it is much easier to dangle the bag of money in front of people's noses and say, do this and get that, compared to motivating people to mastery, purpose, autonomy, and belonging, which takes more leadership. So managerial laziness, if you ask me. Anyway, um, there are many organizations out there who have you have well-intended theory why leadership visions, but it doesn't help to have leadership uh, theory why leadership visions if you have theory X management processes, which is the case in a lot of companies, because this creates these poisonous gaps between what we preach and what we practice. So we need to change your management. If we want, need to change your management processes to better reflect what we hopefully say and believe in when it comes to people, so, while at the same time making these management processes more VUCA robust. And what does, what does that mean in practice? Well, here are some examples. We typically need to address the traditional detailed annual budget because it represents so much of what lies in that lower left hand corner. More specifically, when we should set uh, goals and targets, we need to think more like uh, uh, football or soccer. I have yet, yet to mean, uh, meet the football or soccer team that um, says that the ambition for next season is to score uh, 35 goals and get 42 points. Those are budget goals and they don't think like that. They think in terms of doing performing well against peers, they think in terms of league tables, as we say in Europe. We need to, and, and, and sometimes also in organizations, that kind of thinking uh, makes sense. When it comes to the rhythm of our processes, we need more dynamics into, into this. Why on earth shall everything circulate around the fiscal year of typically January to December? We need more business-driven, more event-driven processes where it, it's possible and where it makes sense. And last but not least, evaluating performance cannot be reduced to comparing two numbers and then conclude. We need a richer, broader performance language. And this, my friends, was a crash course in beyond budgeting. 
this is what Beyond Budgeting is about, addressing both leadership and management processes in a coherent way in order to become more adaptive and more human. Not necessarily as a goal in itself, but as you all know, this is what it takes to survive, to thrive, to outperform in today's and tomorrow's people and business realities. A number of organizations are today on this journey in some form or shape, and here are some of them. And I could have talked for hours and hours um, about um, fantastic uh, cases here, uh, and you will be familiar with, with uh, many of them, I, I believe. Um, I'd just like to pick out two here, and then we need to move on. I want to start in Norway. In the upper left-hand corner, you see a company called Miles. Miles is an IT software company. Miles have a business in um, Norway, the Baltics, South Africa, and India. They have no budgets, no targets, just a lot of great performance. If you work for Miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, as expensive as you want, replace it as often as you want. No travel budgets, no, uh, no sorry, no, no, no PC budgets whatsoever. You can attend whatever conference uh, seminar you want, as often as you want, wherever in the world. No travel budgets, no training budgets. But it's not an anarchy. When you have bought that PC, when you have returned from that conference, you need to post on the internet what you did and the cost of it. So transparency is the only uh, control mechanism on top of another very important process, recruitment, which is the process they spend the most energy on in the company. Very simple philosophy. If we get it right at recruitment, the rest follows. And they seem to have proven that, uh, that um, assumption right. Some of you will know that the pioneer, the veteran in Beyond Budgeting is a bank, a Swedish bank called Handelsbanken. You see them at the top here. Uh, this bank has around 700 branches in Northern Europe, quite big in the UK, by the way. It was uh, long the fastest growing bank in the UK. And the amazing thing with this bank is not only how long they have been operating without budgets, targets, and individual bonus, already back since 1970, but it is just as amazing the performance this has given them. This bank has been, been performing better than the average of its competitors. That is how they define performance, by the way. Better than the average every single year since 1972. This bank is, is among the most cost-effective universal banks in Europe. And the bank has never needed any bailout from the authorities because they messed it up. It can't be a coincidence a uh, radically different um, management model from, from, from almost all other banks with a lot of autonomy, a lot of transparency, a very positive view on, on, on people and a lot of simplicity in the management processes and this fantastic sustained performance over such a long time. Handelsbanken and some other companies inspired, including Boyalis, uh, inspired what became known as Beyond Budgeting in the late uh, uh, 90s. And the Beyond Budgeting Principles was actually formulated three years before the Agile, or four years before the Agile Manifesto. Um, there was no contact between the communities at the time, but there were still many similarities in the thinking. And fortunately, that contact thing has, has changed. Um, and the fact I'm, that I'm, I'm speaking with you guys right now is, is an example of that. I'd like to share with you these uh, principles uh, in case you haven't seen them. They look like this. We don't have the four at the top, we go straight for the 12. And again, you can see that we are addressing both leadership and management processes. On the leadership side, I did briefly touch upon purpose, values, transparency, and, and autonomy. When it comes to organization, we are actually quite agnostic when it comes to structure. Um, we think this can work in many structures as long as you uh, avoid the hierarchical control and bureaucracy. So you, you don't need to move into any tribes and squads in order to go beyond budgeting. What we say about leadership here is in a way not that unique. I mean, many other communities and, and, and movements will say similar things, but very often 
uh, they haven't thought hard enough about what kind of management processes do you need to activate these nice words. And likewise, there are many good management models out there, but they haven't thought very much about what kind of leadership is needed to underpin these management processes. In Beyond Budgeting, we are trying to do both because we are so focused on creating that coherence between what is said on the left-hand side, what is done on the right-hand side. And two classical examples of the opposite that you find in so many organizations. It doesn't help that we on the left-hand side talk loud and warm about how fantastic people we have on board. And we would be nothing without you. And we trust you so much, but not that much. Moving to management processes, resource allocation, kicking out the travel budget, are you crazy? Hypocrisy, poisonous gaps between what we preach and practice. Another example, it doesn't help that we talk equally loud and warm about um, uh, we and us and together and team and uh, collaboration and everybody in the same boat. If every, the only thing we do on rewards, principle 10 is about individual bonus. Again, hypocrisy. These principles are principles. This is not a management recipe. So what this should mean in an organization depends on that organization's case for change. It depends on their business, their history, their culture. So it's not identical what has happened in all the organizations you saw on the, on the previous uh, slide. And that is the way it should be. I don't like management recipes because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. The only thing you have to, to do is to buy the books and read them, by the way, hire the consultants, tick the boxes uh, and get the certification, by the way. I find that quite boring and also quite dangerous. Here you have to think for yourself and that is the way it should be. Let me finish off here on this slide with two classical misunderstandings about uh, beyond budgeting, both linked to principle 10. Some people think this is just another way of managing cost. Well, it is, but there are 11 other principles. This is about much more than cost management. This is actually quite a complete uh, leadership management uh, model. Second misunderstanding, beyond budgeting, no budgets, cost is not important, I can spend whatever I want. No, that's not what you're saying. Cost is still important together with other things in order to create value in order, and because cost is important. We need, as I said before, more intelligent, effective ways than what Mr. McKinsey uh, offered us a hundred years ago. Some people, especially finance people, find, and actually some executives as well, find the totality of this a bit scary, a bit big. And in a way, I can understand that. If it is the case, I have some good news. There is a safe, not that safe, but there is a safe way of getting started, which is logical and uh, uh, not scary and uh, a great way to get started that later can take you into these bigger and more important discussions. And it simply, it has to do with asking ourselves a very simple question, namely, why do we budget? What's the purpose of the budget? And when I've asked again, hundreds of thousands of people that question, almost everybody comes up with three different purposes. We use budgets to set targets. It could be financial targets, sales targets, production targets. At the same time, those budget numbers shall represent the kind of forecast of what next year can look like in terms of cash flow, financial capacity. And last but not least, that budget uh, represents a, a resource allocation mechanism, handing out bags of money to the organization on um, cost and on investments. And it might seem very efficient to solve all three in one process and one set of numbers, but that is also the problem. And let, let me explain why. Assume that we are on our way into a budget process and uh, upstairs in corporate finance, we start on the, we want to understand the uh, next year's cash flows. So we ask uh, uh, people responsible on the revenue side, what's your best number for next year? But everybody knows that the revenue number I'm sending upstairs will come back to me as a 
as a revenue target, maybe with a bonus attached. And that insight might actually do something to the level of numbers submitted. And in the same way, when we ask people about their best uh, cost or investment number, and everybody <clears throat> knows that this is my only shot at getting access to resources for next year. And some might also remember that 20% cuts from last year. Well, that insight and that memory might also do something to the level of numbers submitted. <coughs> this is a problem, not just because it destroys the quality of numbers, but it also because it stimulates this behavior that is at least borderline unethical. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> Fortunately, there is a very simple solution. We can, if we want to, still do all these three things, but we should do them in three separate processes because these are different things. A target is an aspiration, it's what we want to happen. A forecast is an expectation, it's what we think will happen, whether we like what we see or not, brutally honest. And resource allocation is about optimizing scarce resources to get to where we want to be. And the separation not just allows this to become different numbers, like a target be more ambitious than a forecast. More importantly, it opens up a big improvement agenda because now we can start to improve the way we do each of these in ways impossible when it was all bundled in one process and one set of numbers on the left hand side. Now can we have great discussions about how, how can we set targets that really inspire and stretch without people feeling stretched? How can we set targets that are more root robust? And so on and so on. Some companies continue this discussion into do we need targets at all? And we just heard about two companies that have concluded that no, we don't. I'm not saying that you shouldn't set targets, um, but we should question everything we do. And we might have time to come back to that discussion afterwards. How can we? get the politics out of forecasting so that we have an unbiased process that we, where we know we can trust the numbers and we don't need a million details here. This is forecasting. We are looking at the future. There's uncertainty. Very different from looking at the past through accounting where details and precision and decibels make sense and sometimes it's required and there is no uncertainty. We can't bring with us the accounting mindset into the things we discuss here. And last but not least, how can we find alternatives to the traditional way, McKinsey way of managing cost? And these are headlines of some alternatives here. I don't have time right now to go through uh, in, in detail. This is a, a seminar on its own, how, how to manage cost without a budget. But uh, um, just one example. At Equinor, we do not have a traditional detailed annual investment budget. In, with such a budget, you sit in the autumn the year before and you decide everything, exactly how much to invest next year, exactly split on these projects, and then you hand out these bags of project money to each project for next year. We don't do that. Instead, we have a process uh, inspired by the following. The bank is always open. The line, the business can always forward a proposal for a project at any time. If you get a yes or no depends on two things. How good is your project? And do we have the capacity as things looks today in financial terms, in organizational terms? And we call this a dynamic resource allocation. And here is another similarity with, with Agile. Agile talks about continuous delivery of software functionality. This is continuous delivery of decisions and funding dynamic resource allocation. Last but not least, when we have separated, we can organize the rhythm around each one on a cadence that not just reflects um, the individual purpose, but also the kind of business that we are into. So we can have a more event-driven, business-driven, and less of a calendar-driven rhythm. This is an important slide, even if it is kind of finance heavy, because when finance people or others uh, say that it's impossible to operate without a budget, and we can respond that, well, by doing this, we still do what that budget tried to do for us. But because we've separated, then we can do 
each thing, each one in much better ways. So how scary is that? And as I said uh, earlier, this is a kind of innocent organic backdoor into the bigger beyond budgeting discussions around the 12 principles. And I have helped around 30 of the companies that you saw on that logo slide um, to get started on their beyond budgeting journey. And with the majority, this is where we started out. So again, an important slide. All right, um, I'm gonna finish this session uh, with how we are applying beyond budgeting at Equinor. So what I know we share is our way of doing this. It's not the way, because the, as I said, there are many ways, but this is our way. And it is heavily inspired by beyond budgeting. There are, as you will see, if you are familiar with the so-called balance scorecard, there are some similarities with the balance scorecard, but I have a very ambivalent view on the balance scorecard because too often balance scorecards are used to reinforce traditional management of centralized command and control and micromanagement. And if that is what you want, it is a fantastic tool for that purpose, but it can also be used in a very different way. And that is what we are trying to do. So three purposes, it's about translating strategy and also managing risk. It's about securing this agility I've just talked about. And last but not least, it is about activating important values and leadership principles in the company. There are some steps in this process, which um, um, well, some people tell us that, well, we have something similar. And that might be the case, but I think the way we do much of this is quite different from the average company. Uh, but it starts out not that unique. We translate strategy into what we call strategic objectives. So what does success look like on a medium term time horizon? We are more on words than on numbers. And we strongly encourage the organization to use a, a simple, straightforward, uh, even a folksy um, language here. We should not invite the organization to play bullshit bingo with these strategic objectives. Unfortunately, that is often the case in many organizations. Then it's time for risk. So what kind of risk can, can kind of hinder us in achieving these objectives? Are there other risks in our activities that we need to address? Then it's time for actions. What kind of actions do we need to undertake to move towards those objectives, to mitigate risk? And very often it is one of the same thing. So that's why it's one process and one common action database. We also try to understand consequences of actions through forecasts. Then it's time to time for measurement. How can we measure that we are moving towards these um, strategic objectives? Uh, the only problem with measurement is that measurement alone moves nothing. Nothing happens just because we measure. I mean, you don't lose weight simply by weighing yourself. And I actually know because I've tried and it was not a big success. Um, it didn't help that my wife told me that, Jochte, maybe you didn't stand there long enough. Anyway, that might have been some kind of action, but the point is that nothing happens before we do something. That is why we've called it ambition to action. And the reason we have called these indicators instead of KPIs is because the I in KPI stand for indicator. They are indicating that we are moving towards these objectives, but they are not necessarily telling the full truth. They are not called KPTs, key performance truth. They are called key performance indicators. Right? And we must never forget. That is why they are called indicators. And last but not least, what does all of this mean for you and me and the teams that we are in? Um, and here comes an example of activating a very important principle in Ecuador, maybe the most important one, which says the following. How we deliver is as important as what we deliver. And with how we deliver, we talk about the values in the company and the weighting between the two in all consequences for your career, for your pay is 50-50. When this was introduced, um, I recall some people said that, well, that was a brave decision because not too many other companies are doing this. There are some. I wouldn't call it a brave decision. I would call it an obvious decision because how can we say that we want to be a values-based organization 
if everything around values is completely absent from our performance process. That would have been a pretty big gap between what we said and what we did. What you see here is an integrated performance process. It runs quite seamlessly from strategy via risk, via finance into human resources. And we have worked very closely the four functions to make this hang together because it must hang together. If it doesn't, the four functions might not notice, but people out there notice. And if it doesn't hang together, if it uh, even contradicts, then um, you lose a lot of the potential power of an integrated, truly integrated process. Here is an example of an ambition to action. It's actually a screenshot from a corporate version from a little while back. Um, they all start with an ambition statement. And he, here you can see the ambition of Ecuador shaping the future of energy. And then you recognize the first four steps from the previous slide, and then the HR process following on after that. And the five perspectives that you see behind uh, <clears throat> or next to the red arrows, um, that is picked from the balanced scorecard thinking. And the, the rationale here is that we want to create value. And uh, so at the bottom, we are saying something about uh, finance. <clears throat> no organization will create value unless we perform well against customers and markets. That will never happen uh, unless we do well on internal operations, which will never happen unless we do well on people and organization. <clears throat> and in our case, safety, security, and sustainability. <coughs> Sorry about that. Maybe I shouldn't go skiing tomorrow uh, after all. We'll see. Anyway, uh, today we have around 900 of these in the um, company. And I'd like to, and this represents more or less the organizational structure. And you might say, wow, that is a deep hierarchical structure. Um, uh, well, my response is that uh, if you look at our organization chart, it, it uh, looks quite traditional, but it says nothing about all the collaboration taking uh, place across. It says nothing about the low power distance in the organization. Organization charts never tell the, the, the true story. Two important aspects here. First, alignment. We need alignment. There has to be a red thread throughout. We have strategies that we, uh, that we need to, to, to execute and implement. The easy way to create alignment is um, top-down cascading. Corporate instructing, uh, typically all the way down. This is the content of your ambition to action, especially when it comes to the numbers. And um, you know, many, many finance people, they like top-down cascading because afterwards they can add up all the local numbers and it matches the corporate number down to the last decimal and they can sleep well at night. We are going to deliver because it all hangs together. Well, I wish it was that simple. And in our culture, it isn't that simple because that top-down cascading easily destroys everything around ownership, commitment, motivation. If your own ambition to action only becomes a landing ground for instructions from above, that ownership walks out the door and it doesn't help that the numbers add up. We still need alignment. We create that through what we call translation. And this is more than playing with words. It's a very different process. Translation means that when a team shall either establish um, a new ambition to action from scratch or update an existing one, they should look around. One level up, further up, maybe all the way to corporate, left and right if they have business relations that way. And then the team should have a deep and good discussion. What should our ambition look like in order to support those that we have a relationship to? And if that um, uh, translation should go wrong when it comes to direction, when it comes to ambition levels, of course, the level above should do what they are paid for, but it's not a big problem. And a main reason for that is, again, transparency. Because all of these ambition to actions are open, accessible to all employees. There should be no place to hide for the stupid ambition to action. There is some share sensitive uh, confidential information we have to hide, but that is something people um, understand. So we are using um, transparency as a gentle control mechanism, but the main purpose is still learning. We want people to surf around and learn and be inspired uh, from other people's uh, and other teams' uh, ambition to action. 
Ownership is also a reason why this is not mandatory. This is something that these uh, units decide for themselves if they want to have or not. Uh, if they say no thanks, um, we say that's fine. If you want to use uh, PowerPoint, Excel, uh, Word, uh, that's fine, but you still need to do the leadership job. You still need to talk about tomorrow, not just today. You still need to address risk. You need some action planning, you need some measurement. Uh, if you use the system where all of this is, um, then, uh, and believe it or not, it's actually programmed into SAP. Yes, you heard correctly, and it works. Um, if you use uh, SAP or MIS, as this module is called, then you get a lot for free. Last year, written, uh, we are trying to move out of a calendar-driven process here into something that is more business and event-driven. So all these units can, in principle, change whatever they want on their own ambition to action when something happens in their own business reality that they think justify uh, um, an update. When it comes to uh, uh, forecasts, when it comes to actions, when it comes to uh, even strategic objectives, or, uh, and also targets. If a target has lost its meaning, impossible to achieve, or piece of cake. But again, it's not an anarchy. In addition to the transparency control mechanism, we have said that if you want to change something that's big, you still need to have a talk with the level above. If this is a small change, you just inform them at a suitable time. Big or small, always inform others that might be affected by your changes. So that's the coordination part of it. When this was introduced, people said, great, I like this. But by the way, what is big and what is small? And some had expectations that we should define that on behalf of everybody at corporate level. That's impossible. So we've delegated it. So it might be somebody in one part of the organization with a different definition of big and small than somebody in another part. But that is okay as long as it works both places. I want you to think back to the roundabout, the self-regulation. We would like this to run as much as possible by itself. And we would like these teams to, to perceive and experience ambition to action as something they have mainly in order to help themselves to manage their own business. We should not abdicate from corporate, we shall intervene if needed, support if needed, but the main purpose of this is to help business to help themselves. I'd like to finish with a very important part of the model, namely the holistic performance evaluation, <clears throat> which I already have touched a bit on. <coughs> And holistic here means two things. First of all, the 50-50 between the, the, the how and the what that we talked about. But holistic also means that when we shall evaluate what we have delivered in business terms, then that shall be an evaluation against the whole ambition to action. I'm not just adding up the number of red and green indicators and then conclude. Because these are only indicators. We need to move beyond and behind measure results by asking some simple questions. I see that your indicator is green, but if I look at what measurement did not pick up, have we really moved towards that or those strategic objectives? How ambitious were those targets? Should we punish somebody that stretched themselves and didn't completely make it and do the opposite with somebody that did the opposite? Has there been significant changes in assumptions, headwind, tailwind, of such a magnitude that we should take it into account. Not everything, but big things should be taken into account. How was risk handled? And what's the sustainability of what you have delivered? Or did you do some strange things just before evaluation time to make things look nicer? And I think you know what I mean. The purpose of this evaluation hasn't changed very much over the years. It has all, always mainly be, uh, been for a learning and development purpose. There has always been a reward purpose as well, but we have actually weakened that pay for performance link over time. And one, one example of that is that we used to have a, a, a rating scale here of one to five in both dimensions. So there was a five by five matrix, um, which then had kind of links to, to reward implications. Uh, Nobody liked it, including myself, so we kicked it out. So now there's a much more assessment-based link to, to these two purposes. And again, with a weaker link to the rewards than what, what we used to have. 
So that is what I wanted to share with you. This, these are my coordinates. Uh, uh, highly appreciate if you want to follow me on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And I promise I only tweet and write about stuff like this. There are no cats and dogs and grandchildren, not at all. Um, and if you're even more interested, check out the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, which is a, an international network of companies interested in, in, in this. Um, so check out our website. We've had a few technical problems uh, the last few days. Uh, but just try again a bit later if you can't get in. And what you just heard was actually the very short version of this big topic. This is a longer version. Um, I've been trying to, here is more about everything, um, uh, including problems, uh, the model itself, uh, what we did in Borealis. Uh, there was a chapter about beyond budgeting and agile because there are so many similarities. And obviously, um, a lot more about implementation advice, which I haven't been able to talk about today. And I, I'm, I was trying to write the book I wanted to, to, to read myself. So people tell me it's, an, it's quite an easy uh, read as such. Um, and don't ask me why the first uh, languages this, this book was translated into was uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Russian. But uh, quite interesting. Anyway, with those words, I'm going to stop sharing and I look forward to your questions and our discussion. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Piat. It was awesome. So uh, now I discover I have to buy your book again. <laughs> That's not really funny. Anyways. <laughs> Thank you.